Hello friends, welcome to our today's lecture on inflammatory bowel syndrome. Now, inflammatory bowel disease is a chronic condition that results from inappropriate mucosal immune activation. So, this indicates that inflammatory bowel diseases are the part of autoimmune diseases. And the IBD mainly comprises of two kinds of diseases, the Crohn's disease and the ulcerative colitis. Now, the ulcerative colitis is actually only limited to the colon and rectum and it extends or it involves only the two layers of the GIT that is the mucosa and the submucosa. Whereas the Crohn's disease which is normally referred to as regional enteritis because it frequently involves ileum. So, and it, all, all, it can involve any area of the GIT and it is typically transmural that is it uh, uh, affects all the four layers of the GIT that is mucosa, submucosa, muscularis layer and also the adventitia or the serosal layer. So this is very much important please please remember this. Now let us know some epidemiology related to the inflammatory bowel diseases. It is known that both the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease frequently present in the teens and early 20s with the former being or the ulcerative colitis being slightly more common in females. Inflammatory bowel diseases is the most common among Caucasians and in the United States it occurs three to five times more often among Eastern European Jews than the general population. This is uh, just due to some genetic factors. Now what is the pathogenesis of IBD? It is believed that IBD results from the combined effects of alterations in host interaction with intestinal microbiota or intestinal epithelial dysfunction or abnormal mucosal immune responses and altered composition of GERD micro microbiome. And uh, mostly the IBD is related with genes. So one of the genes that is mostly strongly associated with Crohn disease is NOD2. That stands for nucleotide oligomerization binding domain 2 which encodes an intracellular protein that binds to bacterial peptidoglycans and activates signaling events, which also includes the NFKB pathway. Despite the increase in risk attributable to NOD2 polymorphisms, it should be remembered that only fewer than 10% of individuals carry risk associated with NOD2, uh, NOD2 variants. So it is not compulsory that all uh, individuals suffering from Crohn's disease has this uh, genetic association of NOD2 but it's just strongly somewhere in 10 to 10 or less than 10 percent it is somewhere related to genetic factor also. Now the symptoms of Crohn's disease. The systemic symptoms of Crohn's disease include fatigue, fever and unintentional weight loss. This is mainly due to uh, malabsorption or not the proper digestion of food as the ileum is essential for uh, digestion and in Crohn's disease mainly ileum is affected so it creates problem in digestion and the person may feel a weight loss and fatigue due to malabsorption and uh, the gastrointestinal symptoms include abdominal pain, watery diarrhea and the malabsorption symptoms like steatorrhea. Uh, ileum is mainly responsible for uh, uh, digestion or absorption of uh, fat mostly. So if uh, the in the Crohn's disease if ileum gets affected so we can see steatorrhea that is the condition where we can see fat in the stool and uh, next due to the transmural inflammation uh, the we see fistulas formation in the Crohn's disease where the fistulas are the communications between the two epithelial organs and there can be three kinds of fistulas which can be seen in Crohn's disease this can be enteroenteric which means from one part of the intestine to the another and if we palpate we can feel it like a 
small mass. Second, it can be entrovesical, which means that from the intestine to the another organ like the bladder and they cause pneumaturia. Pneumaturia is the condition of passing of gas in the urine. It is important to remember this. And it can also be third is the entrocutaneous fistulas, which is where the intestine connect to the skin surface. So there are three kinds of fistulas can be uh, formed in the cases of Crohn's disease. Now next, uh, sometimes we feel that a phlegmin can form, uh, the, which is uh, where there is localized area of inflammation in the intestinal wall that gets infected and later it uh, leads to formation of an abscess. Now the other symptoms of the Crohn's disease, they include that sometimes individuals get perirectal abscesses, fissures and even cutaneous fistulas around the rectum. There can be oral involvement like aphthys ulcers. This aphthys ulcer is a non-specific term that refers to an ulcer of the mouth. Particularly this aphtha or aphthys means oral ulcer or ulcer of the mouth. These ulcers are caused due to inflammation in the body linked to Crohn's disease as well as vitamin and mineral deficiencies due to malabsorption. Or it may also lead to gingivitis that is inflammation of the germs as well as esophageal symptoms like odinophagia and dysphagia. Dysphagia is uh, difficulty in swallowing. Whereas odinophagia is pain during swallowing. Now they can also be gallstones that lead to biliary colic. This is because uh, Crohn's disease can cause inflammation in the small intestine. So this inflammation affects the small intestine's ability to absorb bile salts and the bile soil salts thus bind to cholesterol and make it water soluble. That's the function of the bile salt. But without enough bile salts because of the inflammation of the small intestine and since it does not absorb it, uh, the cholesterol can collect in the gallbladder to form stones. And uh, thus the biliary colic occur which is defined as pain in the abdomen due to obstruction caused by stones in the cystic duct or common bile duct of the biliary tree. Now some extra intestinal symptoms are similar to those of ulcerative colitis that include arthritis, uveitis, episcleritis and skin lesions like pyoderma gangrenosum. Pyoderma gangrenosum is often associated with autoimmune diseases such as ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease and arthritis. And uh, erythema, erythema nodosum can also be seen as well as primary sclerosing, cholangitis and venous or arterial thromboembolisms are common in Crohn's disease as well as ulcerative colitis. Now on top of all those, Crohn's disease specifically can cause kidney stones as well. This is also due to uh, malfunctioning of the uh, small intestine leading to reduced absorption of the calcium ions and thus the calcium and uh, uh, forms in the forms stones in the kidney. The calcium absorption in the Crohn's disease is affected mainly due to malabsorption of vitamin D. Vitamin B, uh, sorry, vitamin D itself being the fat soluble vitamin is not absorbed properly due to uh, affection of the small intestine in the cases of Crohn's disease and thereby we see that the calcium is malabsorbed and it leads to uh, kidney stones. Now in this slide we will see different pictures of symptoms of Crohn's disease. In primary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, the inflammation causes scars within the bile duct. These scars make the ducts hard and narrow and gradually cause serious liver damage. A majority of people with primary sclerosing cholangitis also have inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Next in this picture we can see aphthys ulcer. 
which is also known as canker sores. They are small, shallow lesions uh, that developed on the soft tissue in your mouth at the base of your gums, particularly. This picture demonstrates pyoderma ganglion gangrenosum. It is a rare condition that causes large painful sores or painful ulcers to develop on your skin, most often on your legs. And the exact cause is not known but it appears that it is somewhere associated with disorders of the immune system or with some autoimmune diseases. Now the last picture demonstrates the symptom of erythema nodosum. It is characterized by tender red bumps usually found symmetrically on the shins like the both of the shins involve them and erythema nodosum is a type of paniculitis that is an inflammatory disorder affecting subcutaneous fat of the skin. Now let's dive deep into the morphology of Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease may occur in any area of the GIT but the most common site involved are, is terminal ileum, ileocecal valve and cecum most commonly being the terminal ileum. The presence of multiple separate sharply delineated areas of disease results in skip lesions which is the characteristic of Crohn's disease and this may help in differentiation from ulcerative colitis. Then there are also the formations of strictures which is abnormal narrowing of a canal and uh, they do not generally develop in ulcerative colitis but are common in Crohn's disease. Now the earliest lesion is the aphthys ulcer in the cases of Crohn's disease that may progress and the multiple lesion often coalesce into elongated serpentine ulcers oriented along the axis of the bowel. So please remember this uh, green highlighted points because they are commonly asked in uh, your exams like uh, what is the common site of Crohn's disease then the answer will be terminal ileum. Then how will you differentiate Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis? One specific uh, point will be skip lesions. Then in the two strictures are formed in Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis then the answer would be Crohn's disease. And the earliest lesion that uh, is present in Crohn's disease is aphthys ulcer. Now this slide demonstrates the skip lesions that we have talked in the previous slide about. The skip lesions are uh, representing that the, in uh, Crohn's disease it is not compulsory that whole of the colon or uh, whole of the small intestine be involved. It may be like small part of the uh, intestine and then the small part of the large intestine to be involved in the cases of Crohn's disease and due to this skipness of the Crohn's disease uh, this it is particularly called that the Crohn's disease causes skip lesions and uh, later we uh, will we'll study that it causes transmural inflammation or we have actually studied that it causes transmural inflammation that is it affects all the four layers of the GIT and thus it gives us the look of serpentine ulcers. Serpentine means snake-like. So there is snake-like ulcers in the cases of Crohn's disease. Also we can see ulcerations and fissures and due to this serpentine ulcers there is commonly the formation of fistulas which we have discussed earlier. Now due to the patchy distribution of Crohn's disease that is due to skip lesions of the Crohn's disease it actually results in coarsely textured cobblestone appearance in which diseased tissue is depressed below the level of normal. That means uh, in the Crohn's disease since some part uh, suppose this is the small intestine so, so some part of the intestine is diseased while the other part is non-diseased. So the diseased tissue it gets depressed or, or gets below the level of normal mucosa and because of this it gives the appearance of cobblestone. This is important please remember and uh, the appearance of cobblestone will be explained to you in the next slide with picture. 
Next is that fissures frequently develop between mucosal folds and it ex extend deeply to become fistula. As I have told you earlier that because of serpentine ulcer, uh, the fistulas are very much common in Crohn's disease and it can also lead to perforations, perforations like holes uh, in the cases of Crohn's disease. Now the intestinal wall is thickened and rubbery as a consequence of transmural edema, inflammation, submucosal fibrosis and hypertrophy of the muscularis propria which all, all of this contribute to stricture or narrowing of the canal of the small intestine due to fibrosis, the hypertrophy, the inflammation, this all leads to the narrowing of the uh, small canal of the small intestine or the large intestine. This is what is known as stricture formation. Now, in cases with extensive transmural disease, uh, there is mesenteric fat frequently extending across around the serosal surface. This is known as creeping fat. What happens in Crohn's disease? Uh, suppose uh, this is the uh, small intestine if you imagine. Then the uh, around this there is fat accumulation. So this is known as creeping fat. Uh, this is just due to extensive transmural involvement of the Crohn's disease. Uh, this slide shows you the cobblestone appearance in the cases of Crohn's disease. This picture uh, basically suggests you about the endoscopic uh, uh, image in, during the examination where, they, where the intestine seems like cobblestone appearance. Here is what is cobblestone is like in the real world. Like it is the cobblestone in real and this is how the small intestine appeared to be when uh, affected by Crohn's disease. So this cobblestone is just a natural building material of cobble sized stones. This is what is cobble sized stones and they are usually used in pavement of roads, streets and building and because of this, this is uh, known that uh, the, in the Crohn's disease it gives such appearance and this, all, this image also suggests the cobblestone appearance in the cases of Crohn's disease. Now let us study about the histological microscopic features of Crohn's disease. Uh, the active Crohn disease include abundant neutrophils. Why only neutrophils? Because neutrophils are the first cell to appear in the sites of inflammation. So the Crohn disease lead to abundant neutrophils that damage the crypt epithelium. What are crypts? Crypts are small tubular glands which are the part of the both the small intestine and large intestine. So the cluster of neutrophils within a crypt are referred to as crypt abscesses and they are often associated with crypt destruction. So the neutrophils which appears in the crypts they actually destroy them and they form crypt abscesses. The first thing which we see in the Crohn's disease is crypt abscesses. Now the repeated cycles of crypt destruction and regenerations lead to distortion of the mucosal architecture. So the mucus architecture distorts and the normally straight and parallel crypts now take the shape of bizarre branching shapes which is abnormal branching shapes and unusual orientations to one another. The picture to this will be shown in the next slide. Next is paneth cell metaplasia which may also occur in the left colon where the paneth cells are not normally absent. So the no, panic cells are normally absent in the left colon but due to this metaplasia we see that the panic cells do appear in the left colon. The panic cells are the highly specialized secretory epithelial cells which are located in the small intestinal crypts of liver pumon. non cessating granulomas can be seen. This is a hallmark of Crohn's disease. non cessating granulomas is non-necrotizing granulomas. This is a spatial and a hallmark finding which is found only in the cases of Crohn's disease and in microscopy and uh, therefore uh, they are approximately found in 35% of cases and may occur in uh, areas of active diseases or in uninvolved regions in any layer of the intestinal wall. They basic, basically present with lympho lymphoid aggregates and they are 
T helper cells one mediated. This uh, you will study in immunology section. Now this slide represents to you the picture of abnormal crypt branching as you can see here this are this is the appearance of the normal colon but uh, due to Crohn's disease the abnormal branching happens in the crypts and it takes the shape of this and uh, in this there is panet cell metaplasia you can see the normally in the colon there is no panet cell but due to this kind of metaplasia uh, we see the appearance of the panet cells now the metaplasia is actually the replacement of one cell type with another mature differentiated cell type. So here the crypts uh, gets uh, exchanged with panet cells in the case of panet cell metaplasia. This last picture demonstrate you the picture of non cisating granuloma specifically this circle and uh, this are those granulomas that do not have a center that has undergone necrosis. So this kinds of granulomas are called as non cisating granuloma whose centers has no necrosis. Whereas in case of cisating granuloma, the necro, the center of the granuloma is necrosed. But in this case, there is no such feature. So this is known as non cisating granuloma that can be seen in the cases of Crohn's disease. Now let us study about ulcerative colitis. It is the chronic inflammation that only involves the mucosal layer of the colon or the rectum and inflammation usually starts in the rectum and then it goes retrograde through the colon. Now let us imagine that this is the large intestine. I'm sorry for my uh, horrible diagram but let us do assume that this is large intestine. So according to uh, the Text the inflammation in the ulcerative colitis first starts in the case in the rectum and then it travels retrograde that is uh, from uh, in the posterior through to the sigmoid colon then the descending colon then the ascending uh, transverse colon and so on so the inflammation usually starts with rectum and then it goes retrograde to through the colon so this is what is happens in ulcerative colitis. Now it can involve only the rectum. If the ulcerative colitis involve only the rectum then this condition is known as ulcerative proctitis. Whereas if it involves both the rectum and the sigmoid colon then it is known as ulcerative proctosigmoitis. Sigmoiditis. So procto means rectum and sigmoid is sigmoid colon and the inflammation of this is known as proctosigmoiditis and if it involves the rectum, the sigmoid colon and the colon up to the splenic flexure. So this bend of the intestine is known as the splenic flexure and if uh, whole of this is involved till this bend is known as distal ulcerative colitis. In some cases if it passed the splenic flexure and it also involves this transverse colon and then this ascending colon except the cecum part then it is known as the extensive colitis and finally it can involve the entire colon including the cecum and this condition is known as pan colitis. Moving on with symptoms of ulcerative colitis, the onset of the disease is gradual and the symptoms are progressive over a few weeks. There may be systemic symptoms such as fever, fatigue, unintentional weight loss as well as dyspnea and palpitations due to iron deficiency anemia. This is caused by the blood loss. As the ulcerative colitis leads to blood loss, there can be seen iron deficiency anemia and due to this the other systemic symptoms of the ulcerative colitis can be seen. Now the gastrointestinal symptoms include bloody diarrhea, colicky abdominal pain, and tenismus. Colicky abdominal pain is a cramp like pain that originates in the small or large intestine whereas tenismus is a feeling that you need to pass tools even though your bowels are already empty but still there is a pain and cramping that uh, makes you feel that you need to pass tool. So that is what is meant by tenismus. Now next is extra intestinal manifestations that is 
as I told earlier, is uh, similar to Crohn's disease, which include arthritis, uveitis, episcleritis, and skin lesions like pyoderma, gangrenosum, and erythema nodosum, as well as primary sclerosing cholangitis and venous or atrial arterial thromboembolism. Now, let us study about the complications of ulcerative colitis. The uh, acute complication include the severe gastrointestinal bleeding and fulmin fulminant colitis, which is continuous bleeding and over 10 stools per day. Another complication is toxic megacolon, which is where the nerves and muscles are damaged and the colon becomes atonic and dilated. In severe cases, it can lead to perforation with peritonitis, which causes fevers and severe abdominal pain. Finally, long-term complications of ulcerative colitis include an increased risk for colorectal cancer, as well as strictures from repeated bouts of inflammation that, uh, that are usually located in the rectosigmoid colon and can sometimes lead to bowel obstruction. Please do remember all the green highlighted uh, points because for the complications of ulcerative colitis as they are asked in the examinations. Moving to the morphology of ulcerative colitis, the first is that the colonic mucosa may be slightly red and glandular, glandular and have extensive broad based ulcers. So in the case of Crohn's disease that was serpentine ulcers but here there is broad based ulcer. Do remember this and uh, the isolated islands of regenerating mucosa often bulge into the lumen to create pseudopolyps. So we can see pseudopolyps and the tips of this polyps may fuse to create mucosal bridge. Next, chronic disease may lead to mucosal atrophy with a flat and smooth mucosal surface that lacks normal folds. So, there can be loss of hostas in the case of ulcerative colitis and uh, therefore we can see in the barium contrast enema that the ulcerative colitis imaging uh, looks like lead pipe rigidity because of loss of hostas in the in the ulcerative colitis due to mucosal atrophy. And unlike Crohn's disease, the mural thickening is not present. The serosal surface is normal and the strictures do not occur in the cases of ulcerative colitis. However, uh, inflammation and inflammatory mediators can damage the muscularis propria and uh, disturb the neuromuscular function leading to colonic dilation and toxic megacolon which carries a significant risk for perforation. Now in this picture we can see the continuous colonic involvement of, in the cases of ulcerative colitis and uh, it begins in the rectum and then it travels ret retrograde to involve colon as well. Now here in this picture there we can see the uh, broad based ulcers in the cases of ulcerative colitis in contrast with the serpentine ulcers that is found in the Crohn's disease as well as we can see pseudopolyps. Uh, polyps are this finger like extensions. So uh, here is the pseudopolyps. This is due to the uh, intensive regeneration of mucosa that bulbs out in the form of polyp and thus it is known as pseudopolyp. Now the histologic or microscopic features of ulcerative colitis in this we can see normally in the crypt abscesses the inflammatory infiltrates, the grip distortion and the pseudopyloric epithelial metaplasia. Next, they can be, uh, the inflammatory process is diff uh, diffuse and it's generally limited to the mucosa and superficial submucosa and the skip lesions are not seen in the case of ulcerative colitis. There are no granulomas and it is Th2 mediated, that is T helper cells 2 mediated, whereas the uh, Crohn's disease was T helper cells 1 mediated. Now let us see the difference between the Crohn's disease and the ulcerative colitis. So first, what, which uh, in the basis of which bowel region is involved in the Crohn's disease, both ileum and colon is involved, whereas in ulcerative colitis, only colon is involved. Then in uh, distribution, the in the Crohn's disease, we see skip lesions, whereas in ulcerative, there is diffuse. 
then stricture yes we can see stricture in crohn disease but we see rarely strictures in the case of ulcerative colitis wall appearance is thick in the case of crohn's disease but it is thin in ulcerative colitis inflammation is transmural involving every layer of the git whereas here it's limited only to the mucosa or it can involve submucosa too pseudopolyps there is moderate formation of crohn's disease uh, pseudopolyps in the crohn's disease but here there is marked pseudopolyps in the case of ulcerative colitis the ulcers are deep and knife like mainly they are serpentine ulcers whereas here there is superficial ulcers and there is, they, they are broad based ulcers now lymphoid reaction is marked in crohn's disease it is moderate in ulcerative colitis fibrosis is marked in crohn's disease where is there is mild to none fibrosis in ulcerative colitis serositis is marked in case of crohn's disease where is it is mild to none in ulcerative colitis there is granulomas in uh, crohn's disease of course where but there is no granulomas in ulcerative colitis there is formation of fistulas and sinuses in the cases of crohn's disease but not in the cases of ulcerative colitis then the perianal fistulas can be seen in the crohn's disease but not in ulcerative colitis the fat and vitamin malabsorption can be seen in case of crohn's disease but not in ulcerative colitis this is mainly due to uh, involvement of ileum in the cases of crohn's disease then the malignant potential uh, with the colonic involvement can be seen in crohn's disease but and in ulcerative colitis they can be seen in all cases that uh, it uh, the ulcerative colitis leads to or uh, has a complication of colorectal cancer but in crohn's disease if the crohn's disease involve colon then only we can see that it, it may lead to malignancy next is recurrence after surgery so crohn's disease can reoccur after surgery it is common but uh, after surgery well, after once the surgery has been performed the ulcerative colitis does not reoccur and uh, the cases of toxic megalocolon is not seen in crohn's disease but it is seen in ulcerative colitis some more specific difference between crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis as we have studied and it will be just a review like uh, the crohn's disease includes skip lesions and there is mainly seen rectal sparing that uh, the rectal is not involved in the cases of crohn's disease but in the cases of ulcerative colitis there is rectal involvement and there is continuous colonic lesions now in the imaging uh, in the barium contrast nmr imaging we see that crohn's disease appears as string sign whereas the in the ulcerative colitis there is a loss of phosphorus leading to lead pipe uh, the image for both of this will be shown to you in the next slide now here there is non cisating granuloma and lymphoid aggregates and it is th1 mediated but there here in the case of ulcerative colitis there is crypt abscesses and ulcers with bleeding and there is no granulomas and it is th2 mediated now uh, both the cases leads to diarrhea but the, in the case of crohn's disease the diarrhea may be bloody or may not be but in the case of ulcerative colitis it is sure that it will be a bloody diarrhea and the crohn's disease may, may be associated with anti saccharomyces cerevis vicia antibodies whereas the ulcerative colitis is associated with mpo anca or p and a and c a antibodies and of course it is associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis this uh, anti saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae antibodies are immune proteins that are frequently present in people who have inflammatory bowel disease whereas this p a and c a or mpo a and c a are the perinuclear anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies these are those antibodies that stain the material around the nucleus of a neutrophil and uh, their most common target is myeloperoxidase and therefore they the this is known as mpo anca uh, because the myeloperoxidase is a neutrophil granule protein whose primary role is in metabolic processes uh, for the regen uh, for the generation of oxygen radicals so 
in Crohn's disease, we see that uh, it is associated with anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibodies, whereas the ulcerative colitis is associated with PANCA or MPOANCA, which is perinuclear antineutrophilic cytoplasmic antibodies. So this picture demonstrates the lead pipe rigidity in the cases of uh, ulcerative colitis. This is due to complete loss of the hostile markings in the diseased segment of the colon and uh, this gives the appearance of smooth walled and cylindrical lining thus uh, indicating a lead pipe uh, appearance and uh, here is the string sign appearance in the cases of uh, Crohn's disease and this is due to incomplete feeling of the intestinal lumen uh, because of narrowing and because of the stricture and fibrosis as of the intestinal intestine which we see in the cases of Crohn's disease. So this uh, leads to narrowing and uh, this leads to incomplete feeling of the intestinal lumen with barium leading to a string sign appearance as seen in this case. Now, how to diagnose uh, inflammatory bowel diseases? Uh, the both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can be diagnosed with colonoscopy with biopsy. Now, next, they can be due to, uh, with the help of lab works that include the complete blood count. With that, will show anemia. If there is anemia, then it could be uh, iron. We should involve the iron studies. Vitamin B12 and folate levels should be accessed. And then other common lab finding will be elevated ESR and the CRP that is C-reactive protein and a low albumin and uh, there will be typically the electrolyte abnormalities that would be from di diarrhea and dehydration. Now typically electrolytes are sent if there, if there is chronic diarrhea and AST and ALT will look for the evidence of hepatitis and creatinine and urea nitrogen will be sent to access the kidneys and the fecal calprotectin levels are typically elevated this is because it's protein released in uh, large amounts by neutrophils in the digestive tract during inflammation so this fecal calprotectin is actually a protein that is released by the neutrophils uh, during the cases of digestive tract inflammation now further to exclude IPS from infectious causes, a routine workup of stool is included for cultures like Salmonella, Shigella, Yersinia, Campylobacter and E. coli and also the microscopy for ova and parasites is done and antigen testing for Giardia lambda is also being done. Now the pathogens which are associated with specific risk factors this include entamoeba histolytica which is associated with travel to endemic countries and clostridium difficult which is associated with recent antibiotic use. They are the risk factors which can also lead to IBS or inflammatory bowel syndrome. Now when ulcerative colitis is specifically suspected then we also do the testing for sexually transmitted diseases such as Neisseria, gonorrhea, Chlamydia trochomatis and herpes simplex virus and Treponema pallidum, especially in individuals with severe rectal symptoms like tenesmus and fecal incontinence. The next step usually involves the imaging and uh, which is uh, not that much needed for the diagnosis but it may show some abnormal findings. One specific imaging is double contrast enema in which the x-rays are taken of the colon by using barium and air as contrast. So this we have seen that in the cases of ulcerative colitis because of the destruction of fosters we see lead pipe sign and uh, in cases of Crohn's disease due to shallow ulcerations of the mucosa and due to strictures we see a string sign and uh, in severity in individuals it is mostly uh, indicated that barium enema shouldn't be done because it can precipitate toxic megacolon and ultimately the most appropriate diagnosis for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is colonoscopy with biopsy and in the biopsy we'll see the histologic findings which we have studied in the cases of both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So the ultimate diagnosis is biopsy with colonoscopy.
Coming on with treatment of ulcerative colitis, this mainly depends on the disease severity that is how much of the colon is involved or what is the frequency of disease relapse or flares. So the disease severity in ulcerative colitis can be mild, moderate or severe. In the cases of mild ulcerative colitis, there are four or fewer stools per day with or without blood and they can be mild crampy abdominal pain and occasional tenesmus. But in the cases of moderate ulcerative colitis, there are five bloody stools per day, abdominal pain with mild anemia and sometimes a low grade fever. In cases of severe, they, there are six or more bloody stools per day with severe abdominal pain, fever, tachycardia, anemia and elevated ESRM weight loss. Now the initial approach for mild and moderate ulcerative proctitis or proctosigmoiditis is treatment with anti-inflammatory drug like 5-amino salicyclic acid or mesalazine. Now this mesalazine works by blocking the activity of cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase thereby reducing the production of prostaglandins and this reduced production of prostaglandin they decreases the inflammation in the colon and uh, also decreases the thus the symptoms associated with ulcerative colitis. Now this can either be administered topically or as a suppository or enema and it can uh, induce disease remission most of the time. If applying it locally isn't comfortable then we can also give it orally but uh, it is generally not as effective as topical mesalazine. If the individuals don't respond to topical 5-ASA within 6 weeks then we should give it both orally and topically or a steroid agent like beclomethazone should be added on. And now individuals with proctosigmoiditis and individuals with proctitis that have more than one relapse a year should continue our maintenance therapy with either topical or oral mesalazine. Now in the cases of severe ulcerative colitis, the initial approach consists of oral glucocorticoids, high dose of oral mesalazine along with either topical mesalazine or topical steroids such as hydrocortisone. If this individual has evidence of an infection like a high fever or leukocytosis with neutrophilia can be seen, then the intravenous antibiotics like ciprofloxacin and or metronidazole can also be Use. Now, individuals that doesn't respond to initial therapy should receive intravenous fluids if needed as well as intravenous steroids such as methylprednisolone. And individuals who do not respond or who do respond, sorry, who do respond should continue on maintenance therapy with oral mesalazine or topical mesalazine and oral glucocorticoids. For topical 5-ASA and oral glucocorticoids, the doses are usually lowered over a few months. Finally, individuals who develop an acute complication like fluminant ulcerative colitis are treated with intravenous fluid along with broad spectrum antibiotics like ciprofloxacin and metronidazole and intravenous glucocorticoids. If the individual doesn't improve after 3 days, then intravenous cyclosporin or infliximab may be tried. And if there is no improve, improvement within a week, then the individual may need to undergo a colectomy, which is the removal of the colon. Infliximab is a monoclonal antibody and it is used to treat a number of autoimmune diseases. And uh, the cyclosporin actually belongs to the immunosuppressants class of drug. Moving on with treatment of Crohn's disease which also depends on the severity for uh, mild Crohn's disease which are at low which are low risk uh, the setup therapy is preferred and is initiated with oral budesonide for 12 weeks. Budesonide is a corticosteroid or steroid uh, and uh, it uh, decreases the reappearance of uh, Crohn's disease signs and symptoms. And oral prednisone or oral mesalazines are alternatives if the individual doesn't respond to budesonide. If there is diffuse colitis or left colon involvement, then the oral prednisolone is initiated if there is only mild left colitis. Then oral sulfasalazine, which is a modified sulfonamide related to 5-ASA can be used. 
If remission was obtained with the glucocorticoid agent, then the maintenance therapy is continued with the glucocorticoid, and the dose is slowly lowered and eventually discontinued over a few weeks. If remission was obtained with a 5 AS or sulfasalazine, then the same agent agents are used for maintenance therapy. Now, in individuals with moderate to severe Crohn's disease, uh, the most preferred therapy is the step down therapy and it's initiated with the biologic agent like infliximab along with an immunomodulator like azathioprine. Azathioprine is a medication that treats diseases which have to do with our immune system. So basically it is uh, used in autoimmune diseases. In uh, individuals above 60 years old, infliximab monotherapy can be used. Finally, in individuals with severe diseases, glucocorticoids such as oral prednisone or budesonide may be used. After remission, maintenance therapy with a biologic agent like infliximab is used and it can be combined with an immunomodulator like azathioprine. Now, the questions related to this topic will do it in the next video. For now, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do like, share and subscribe. Please press the bell icon for more updates.